Please. Stan, I want to talk to you about this. I am stunned that you are a fan of Dude, Top Gun. Dude. I am also surprised and delighted. I think you are too, Stugatz. Uh, the idea, and this, this really does, I am beaming right now at a difficult time in America. The idea of Stan, a lonely Stan Van Gundy, I should say, alone but not lonely, marching right up to a theater again, old-fashioned style. His wife doesn't want to go, but Stan don't care. A young boy dreamt of being a fighter pilot once upon a time, and Tom Cruise taught him the way. Stan Van Gundy marching into a theater in his 60s and sitting his fat ass in front of Tom Cruise to go back to the skies of his youth. I am shocked by that, but not as shocked, not as shocked as I am by Mike Ryan and Amin Al Hassan and their takes on last night's game. So, Stan, I want to bring you in here without telling you anything about how they feel, because I don't know that I could disagree more about how harshly they are raining down on the Miami Heat and the idea that the whole thing needs to be blown up that uh, they are cowards. So, Mike, you please, uh, if I'm misquoting you on anything, present this argument because I am floored that you and Amin have been this aggressive in the way you're attacking the Heat for that performance last night. Uh, for the record, Stan, I am truly a Heat homer. I love my team, and I am hoping that I'm wrong. But, you have the Celtics in six. But I had the Celtics in six after, after game four. Midway through that game four, I kind of knew the jig was up for, for Miami. Boston isn't even playing well offensively, and they're just clobbering Miami right now. And despite my homerism, I've been sounding the klaxon when it comes to my concerns about the lack of aggressiveness from Bam Adebayo while conceding he is a marvelous, unprecedented defensive player for this team. He is also someone that I do not trust. I don't trust Duncan Robinson. I flatly never trusted Kyle Lowry, who the metrics have told me prior to his appearance in a Heat uniform, is one of the worst playoff performers of all time. This team and its deficiencies are finally coming home to roost right now, and it's not enough with a certainly less than 100% Jimmy Butler. Well, it, it, listen, it's I, I think right now the problem is the Heat as they are presently, what we've seen them in the last two and a half games are, are not ready to to win this series, you know, whether it's Butler being banged up and truly not healthy and not able to produce. Um, and then Lowry has been horrendous. I mean, he's given them absolutely nothing um, really at either end of the court. Um, and out of bio, I think the Celtics size is a little much for him. Like, you know, he had the great game in game three. Well, who didn't play in game three? Robert Williams. You know, he had those two big games against Philly. Who didn't play? Joel Embiid. Like, Bam's small. And in today's game, most of the time, that doesn't matter. Um, but when you run into teams that play with size, he struggles. I don't think that's a problem with him. I don't think he's, I don't think he's afraid. I don't, I, I think it's just, He's small, and getting shots up over the top of guys is tough. And he's he's an interesting guy in today's game because he does a lot of things really well. He handles, he passes, he can guard. But he's a small center who can't stretch you out on the floor. So, you know, most of the teams who go small, those guys are three-point shooters. Bam can't do that. And so he's going to score 15 and feet and in. Over the guys the size of the Celtics guys? No, he's not. It's a tremendous breakdown, and I agree with everything that you're saying. I will push against one thing in terms of not being scared. I do think he's just trying to make smart basketball plays mostly because he knows if he tries to take it up, it's not going to result in a foul, a trip to the free throw line. And it's probably going to result in a turnover. But what is always available to Bam, and it started showing in that third quarter last night, is that little running jumper just under the free throw line. That is what Boston is conceding. And he chooses to not take it. He chooses not to. And it's really frustrating. Stan, uh, Mike is accusing, he's accusing Bam of a cowardice. Last night when Jimmy Butler didn't have it, physically, doesn't have it. It's clear. You're paying $90 million to Duncan Robinson. You've got Kyle Lowry to be a missing piece on a championship team. And you're looking at Bam Adebayo be an all-star. They've got an all-star be an all-star. And now he's saying, blow it up. 
And I want to know, like, I'm not being extreme when I say that's his viewpoint. He's like, not good enough, blow it up. Bam was plenty big a game ago, but now he's not physically not, not big today. Not for me. And, and uh, Stan, so you have more background. I've been saying trade Bam the entire run. Since the bubble, I, I, even game three where I was like, oh, my God, that's an epic Bam performance. If you would ask me, Bam for Bradley Beal, I'd do it. I just haven't trusted him. And a team that lacks trade ships, I've always said Bam out of bio is your greatest trade ship. Well, yeah, see, I'm not, first of all, I think let's let's see what happens for the rest of this season before we get into <laughs> what you. we do next year. The biggest problem <laughs> right now, Friday look, evening. both teams are struggling to score. It's not like Boston's not. These are two really good defensive teams playing extremely hard. Boston's, even though they've had their health problems, they're a little bit healthier right now. Um The Heat really need Jimmy Butler, and he was fantastic the first two games and can't can't produce right now. Kyle Lowry's a zero. I think Eric's got a tough decision coming up. Do you play Kyle Lowry in game six or just go back to Gabe Vincent, who is clearly the superior player right now over Kyle Lowry? But that's a you know, that's a tough decision. Um, is it for him to make? Is it because I thought they should have made it in the third quarter yesterday? Like, is it? And I say that as uh, understanding, Stan. This man, I don't understand what you guys do, Stan. I really don't. I don't understand what you and Eric Spolster have to do for decision making purposes. But when he rides with his guys, um, Spolster, Riley, all these guys, they're loyal to a fault with their old guys. And I don't know if Lowry was one of those guys, Wade was obviously, and er- he earned it at every turn. But I don't think that's a tough decision. I saw Lowry in this series has been a liability everywhere. Uh, Having him around to float around and maybe make a 30-footer once in a while and getting torched everyone else and not appearing to adhere to the 8% body fat rule while also having a hamstring issue. No, of course, Gabe Vincent at least will look quicker than him and 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 be more active and shoot from deeper. How is that a tough decision? I would have done it in the third quarter. Well... I think the decision, I understand what you're saying. I think it's clear Gabe Vincent has been the better player. But the decision you have to make as a coach is how do we win? And I think Eric Spolstra is very well aware that Kyle Lowry and Jimmy Butler, neither one are playing well. But if you're going to beat the Celtics, I think the the one calculus is those guys are going to have to step up and play or we're not good enough to beat them. And so you run them out there again. I mean, honestly, you could make the case right now that Victor Oladipo is a better player than Jimmy Butler, too. So Oh, but he looked so not- bad. He looked so bad last night, Stan. So bad. And they looked incompetent. Like some of their shots, 10 of their shots were uh, just ridiculous. Incompetent basketball. Like, like, like you'd see at a playground where kids don't know how to play basketball. Well, wait a minute. I mean, I thought the Celtics looked like that for a large part of the game, too. I mean... Jalen Brown looked like he couldn't take a second dribble without losing it. I mean, part of the incompetence that we've seen out of both teams throughout this series is that the defenses are more than competent. I mean, these teams both play really hard. They switch things. Everybody on the floor, for the most part, um, 90% of them anyway, are very good individual defenders. The intensity level has been high. Um, it's not like Jason Tatum's torn it up, you know, ter- tore it up last night. Jalen Brown had 25 points. He finally decided, I'm just not going to dribble it anymore. I'll just catch it and shoot it. But it, it, it's not like it's a series that's ugly. Let, let's face it. And I don't think that necessarily implies incompetent basketball. It might imply that the other guys are pretty good. I, listen, I think the other thing going into the series, if healthy, I think since the first of the year, Boston's been the best team in the league. Um, I think they, I'm not saying who will win. The Heat could very well come back and win two games, but Boston's the better team in my opinion. I mean, first of all, they are so much bigger. I mean, you look on out there and it looks like the J, just size wise, it looks like the JVs are playing the varsity. I mean, Boston is so big without giving up, you know, without having a skill deficit. So I just think Boston's got more talent. 
um, across the board. They've got more size. They're a they're a better basketball team. That that's that's what I see. And I see the Heat fighting really hard. And what gives them a chance is Jimmy Butler being what he was at the start of the series. That gives the Heat a chance. Without that, it's pretty hard. I mean, listen, the Heat luckily had a huge lead halftime of game three. Jimmy doesn't play the second half. And even that almost went away. I mean, without Jimmy Butler playing well, this isn't a great basketball team. The classic half stand, uh, the stand half yawn. The right mid sentence yawn is my yes. favorite thing. Uh, it's from it's my favorite thing that Stan does. Well, it's uh, a little early out here, guys. I'm on the West Coast. No, so it's totally to do with it. It's his, no, totally it's his hardened cool. step back. Yeah. Uh, Stan, let me tell you who never yawns. That's Al Horford. He loves an ugly series. And I ask you this as a former head coach if I gave you five Al Horfords, would you win an NBA championship? Well, I mean, you need guy. If you're talking his mental makeup and stuff, yes. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. Al Horford is. I don't know that I'd want five guys with his game, but Al <laughs> don't take. Please been, don't take that question hey. seriously, Stan. You got no, take- but he's been he's been the change in the in the Celtics from when they were under 500, and Al Horford really wasn't playing well. I mean, you know, don't forget he didn't play really last year. It took him a time to get going. But what he does, here's the thing with Al Horford. The Celtics, while so many teams in the league are trying to play small ball, the Celtics play big, and they play big because of the skill of their players. So, you know, how many times, if you're the Heat, are you running up against the front line of guys like Robert Williams and Al Horford, and then Tatum and Brown are huge too. Well, wait a minute you know? on the on the huge stuff, Stan, because you're covering the other series. They're also huge against Golden State, are they not? No, not really. I mean, they they start Powell at center, who's like a bam sized center, and then they bring in Maxi Kleba. Listen, one of the adjustments Ime Udoka made that has been really underplayed is they play their bigs on Jimmy Butler now. And they don't switch his pick and rolls. They just go under. They're giving Jimmy Butler pull-up jump shots. And the reason they're doing that is because they don't want to draw fouls. They don't want Jimmy on the free throw line, which is where he thrives. So he shot four free throws in game five yesterday. didn't shoot any in game four. And they're just giving him the pull-up jumper. They will live with that, even though he's a good pull-up jump shooter. But he's going to have to shoot it over size. They've had Robert Williams and Horford guarding him all the time. The Celtics normally a switching team. They're not switching guards on to Jimmy Butler. Great adjustment. They're making he and Bam Adebayo play against guys who are a lot bigger than they are consistently all the time. That Celtic roster, if you look at today's NBA, that's like almost the perfect roster of what you want. Um, They are just absolutely huge, and they've got guys that can shoot the ball. You can argue that their biggest weakness is their ball handling and their ability to get where they want to go against pressure. And the Heat, and Eric has done a great job with this. They've tried to exploit that. They've really gotten into those guys dribbling the ball and they forced them into a lot of mistakes and that's about the only way that he'd have a chance to play them they've really got to create turnovers because even at the end of the shot clock Jason Tatum's like yeah that's great defense you're a foot smaller than I am I'll just shoot over the top of you that analysis stand still doesn't tell me when Mike Ryan says Bam Adebayo is a coward yes or no 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 listen that, that would, listen, here, here's the thing is, so you want Bam to prove that he's, you know, not a coward by taking shots that play into Boston's hands. It doesn't matter. I understand the shot Mike's telling him. Why? I mean, do, do you think there's a reason Boston is conceding that shot? You know, they want to take away threes. I think their thing is now they can get beat by two things by Miami. Jimmy Butler's big nights, which are usually predicated on what? Getting to the free throw. Well, and health. We're going to take that away. And three-point shooting. You Bam and Jimmy, you want to shoot 15-foot jumpers all night? You can't beat us doing that. I don't think this is a 15 
foot jumper though. This is under the free throw line. And I, I want Bam to take that shot because when the, the pressure's not on, I've seen Bam make that shot regularly. And it's it's flashbacks to the Milwaukee series where Budenholzer also dared Bam to make that shot. He actually dared him to take it and he wouldn't take it. What I'm daring Bam to do is take it because I've seen him make it. And in the third quarter, he showed that when the game was out of hand, he can take it and make Stan, it. Stan, this is the best three-point shooting team in the league. How do you come on here when three games ago I thought everything was fine and these teams were roughly even? And when I asked you before the series, who's going to win here, Stan? You didn't say somebody was better. When I asked I you— I still don't know. No, but I'm saying right now, I'm Boston was the best team in the league. I mean, that that's just factual oh, since January the 1st. But I, I didn't pick anybody. I'm still not picking anybody. You don't know what's going on. What I'm saying is Miami, as they're presently constituted, with Jimmy Butler, whether it's an injury or he's just playing poorly, and Kyle Lowry playing like that, the way he's been playing, if this is who the Miami Heat are now physically, then it, they're not close as a team. And the series hasn't really been – Close. I mean, come on. The Heat have won five quarters in five games. Again you with know, the quarters. I mean, He's it, right. It, Again it, with the quarters. The, weird the thing gospel of Sam Van Gundy. Again His with the analysis quarters. has been the best analysis on this series I've heard yet. Stan, Thank you, Stan, Stan. No, Stan, your analysis has been great, and I don't want to leave here because analytically has been great. Again, though, he does not agree with the assessment of Mike that he is a coward. Well, so, he doesn't call anybody a coward. Well, the next, but the next question is, it's not just that, though, Mike. I don't understand why it is. Uh, you say size, uh, Stan, but I was asking in the earlier hour. When I look at size and look at Bam Adebayo against Grant Williams, I was watching an arena full of people saying, Bam, go attack that. Uh, there were, is that, is that, you is, think you can? I'll tell you what. When your game plan is attack Grant Williams, you're in trouble. Did you watch Giannis against him in the last series? Unless the referees decided to let Giannis get away with offensive fouls, he had nothing he could do with Grant Williams. Grant Williams, I, look, I came away from that series in Milwaukee saying that Grant Williams might be the best defender in the NBA. He can go out and guard guards and move his feet. Big guys, you can go over him inside. You can shoot turnaround jumpers. That's what you can shoot because you're not you're not going through him and you're not going by him. Um, he's outstanding defensively and tough as heck, afraid of no one, will take his blows like he did from Giannis and get up and play, and then he can go out and shoot. This Boston roster – the only guy who is not an above average defender and really a well above average defender that they put on the floor is Peyton Pritchard. And he didn't play in the second half last night. And he just they injures guys. At halftime, they shortened their rotation. Everybody they put out there is big and can really guard. So to me, Miami's offensive problems are not really a reflection at totally on the heat let's say that 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 boston defense is for real marcus smart is the blank best defender on the celtics just give me a number where would you rank him first See, second now, third. I'm gonna get, now you're going to get me in trouble just with answer the question boston. just answer the question you're just answer the question. cares about that with all the boston fans oh, just, now just answer the question um, he's he's not he in my opinion i would put grant williams at the top and then i would Put Marcus Smart in the group of – well, no, I'd put Robert Williams a clear second. And then I'd put Marcus Smart in the group with Al Horford, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. I mean, I, to me, those guys are all really – You didn't really, answer the question. You you could be baited okay, in – Okay, so tied – I did. Fifth. Tied, for, tied for third tied. in a – with tied, everyone. Tied I for mean. fifth. Four way, yes, but that's who their team is. And I would say this, though. I want the him reason. aggregated. Juju, Stan Van Gundy said Marcus Smart is tied for sixth or seventh on the Celtics as their I best said, defender. I, and listen, let me also, before I get in too much trouble, let me also tell you why I think he was the defensive player of the year. No. And, and I no. think this no. is him. No, 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 no. no, no. 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 This is no. Grab his mic. This is, Let no. him this speak. Is Let's go to break. Let Sam Let's speak. go to break. No. This is Turn important. off his microphone. They were the best defensive team in the league, and his teammates thought he should have been the defensive player of the year. And I think.
<laughs> He's still talking. You're the defensive player of the year. Then <laughs> you are, Stan. You are right. You are right. They were the best defense in the league, and those other guys thought he should have gotten it because he's the guy the head of it. He sets the tone, but I don't think that makes him necessarily the best defender, but maybe the most important defender with them. I'll certainly defer to his teammates who are all excellent defenders if they think that's who should have gotten it. All right. Uh, we uh, we ended that segment. We're going to have like a clean rejoin break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to uh, turn to something more serious. So, Dan, off to you for a reset with Stan. Uh, directly into it? Yeah, you're coming out. Like, we went yes, with the gag yes, yes, where we yes, faded yes, down yes, Stan yes, a yeah. little bit while he was asking, right, don't right. shut me up, and then he's right. doing that. So, and, and I'll explain that part on air. No, don't explain don't, that. Don't, no. okay. I'm just explaining it for context to everybody here. Okay. All right, so coming out of that, rejoin into you resetting okay. with Stan. Now, I don't plan to, and Stan, we'll, we'll keep you for about 10 more minutes, okay? That's fine. And thank you, as always. I appreciate it, all right? Thank you, Stan. Yep. Stan, I like to go to you on issues happening in America. And when the insurrection happened on January 6th, you said this is just the start. This is not something that is going away. And since then, we have seen basically fomented by Fox News and now a rally here for guns and a, a convention where Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and 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 just these heartbreaking messaging things when you've got kids being slaughtered in a school and you have basically these little uprisings of the mentally ill grabbing guns and then we get into an argument about, argument about gun laws and we keep arguing and it doesn't stop it the next time from happening so i'm i'm yammering a bit but this has been a heartbreaking time in america you've been active politically and we're at war in some ways with each other and everyone's armed and uh, and kids are getting slaughtered, and we can't seem to stop it, and it's the worst problem. Um, th no other country does this as poorly as we do, and it's unsafe here. Our, our, our grocery stores are not safe. Our churches are not safe. Our schools are not safe. Nobody wants to believe that's what America is, Stan. Well, clearly it is <laughs> what we are. I mean... Like, you can come away from the latest shooting in Texas and say a lot of things. You can be saddened and frustrated and angered and everything else. But anybody who says they're shocked is, is lying to you. None of us could be shocked that it happens. It happens regularly. We are numb to it. Uh, our leaders have, you know, moments of silence and offer thoughts and prayers. And nobody does anything. And quite honestly... What, it, what the sickest thing to me about this whole thing is, um, is that people just use these shootings on both sides for political gain. They're, they're not interested in stopping the problem. Like, to me, what happens with all these mass shootings now is you hear about the shooting and then all these people, I'm talking about our political leaders, they're just waiting to hear who was the shooter? Because if it was a white guy who wrote a manifesto, well, now, you know, on the left, we've got our villain. You know, we've got Fox News and we've got all of this. And on the right, they're hoping it was some immigrant from somewhere, you know, where now they can spout their racist beliefs and everything else. No one actually gives a damn that those kids were shot to death in school. No one is looking for a solution. Like, yeah, those guys are all going to speak at the NRA convention. Why? Because those people have money, and the money helps keep them in power, and that's what they care about. And they've got a base of voters out there who want the Second Amendment protected fully and actually even expanded beyond what it meant. And so they're going to appeal to those people. I'm not sure, quite honestly, if we look at, let's say the Senate, because it's easy numbers, of 100 senators, I have a hard time believing there's two or three even whose number one priority in the wake of this is 
we've got to find some solutions so it's safer for kids at school. Everybody cares about the political implications of what's going on. And because of that, anybody who thinks that, you know, this is the greatest country on earth and we don't even care about our kids over who's going to win the next election, forget it. I mean, this is, we are a nation in decline. This is maybe the biggest evidence of it. You would think right now, well, Jacinda Ahern in, in New Zealand, when they had their mass shooting, she said the immediate outcry from everyone is, we can never let this happen again. And they immediately came together and started trying to find solutions. I don't think the answer to this is easy, but I don't think we elect those people to do easy things. They should be coming together now with no concern over who's going to win the 2022 midterms or whether they're going to get reelected and say, you know what? We are at a crisis moment in the history of our country. We need to try to find solutions. And so I don't think, listen, I'm all for gun control. I am. I don't think that's the whole answer. You know, they will talk about, well, this is a mental health issue. Great. What are you doing for mental health in our country? Do we have a mental health counselor in every school? We could do that. Why couldn't we do that? You know, all it's going to cost a little more tax money or reallocation of what we've already got. You know, there's a lot of things that could help this problem. We're not doing any of them. All we want, on both sides, by the way, all we want is the political issue that helps us and our people get reelected. Um, it's embarrassing, to be quite honest. We're, we're becoming over this issue and some others, but over this issue, we're becoming the laughing stock of the world that we would just let this happen to our kids on a consistent basis. I mean, we let it happen to adults too, but when you're going to let it happen to your kids and do nothing about it, I mean, I don't know how much lower we can go than that. And no pause at all to even caucus with your constituency and try to see what exactly the game plan here is. No, the game plan is we're just going to go to the first page of the new Republican Party playbook and the first page of the Democratic playbook. It is infuriating to me, San, that 90% of Americans want common sense gun control reform. 90%. There is plenty of room here for both parties to spin this into a win and get reelected. There is political capital in coming together and giving what 90% of Americans want, and yet they won't do it. It is so goddamn heartbreaking. Well, well, except that uh, it, there's a lot of times where politicians go against popular opinion, and, and you wonder why, because what really wins elections is, is money. And so even in the minority, even 90% of the people wanting common sense gun laws and reform, there's a huge money lobby on the one side and the money will help you get elected. So the politicians play to the money and not even to the people. But, but your, your other point is absolutely right. Like we have not seen anyone, not one person saying, well, I'm a political leader saying what we need to do right now is we need to lock ourselves in the Senate chambers or in the House chambers, and we need to come together and say, what will fix this problem? And the hell with the implications on the next election. We've got kids who can't go to school safely. The, the legacy of these people, and it's been going on at least since Sandy Hook, who have refused to do nothing, history's not going to look on them kindly. History is going to look and say, you people, they didn't even care that their kids no, you, were you, in. no, you sacrificed our children in the name of things That's that... That's exactly no, right. they, no, history will look at this time, Stan. You say money and it is general. It does not have to be general. If you have a repugnant, visceral reaction to seeing Ted Cruz on your television, you should, not just because he's an asshole, though that too, but because after this tragedy with America grieving, a man bought and paid for by the NRA is being sent by the NRA in front of those cameras to make sure he's bought and paid for asshole that can hide behind the politics of this and tell you why guns are okay. Like, that is infuriating, and it's the reason it's not happening. And 
to yell about it and unmask it is one thing, but when both sides agree, our kids can't be slaughtered. And when 90% agree this needs to be fixed, please, God damn it, stop our kids from getting slaughtered. It can't be Ted Cruz of the NRA is out here dressed in the disguise of a politician and he's going to let our kids keep getting slaughtered and be out there doing commercials, doing commercials after when, the, when America's grieving, doing commercials, making the argument, the bullshit argument of everyone should go through a back door, one door to school, and let's put more fucking guns in the schools. And let's more, arm more fucking people. Like, it's, it, it's, not, it's beyond infuriating. Like we can yell about it all we want, but like, what is it doing? 90% of the people say it's so. And, 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 and we're being told, fuck off. Like, fuck off for real what 90% of you want. We lead, we keep the power, and fuck off. We're going to keep getting your kids slaughtered. But that's up to us, too. Like, it, it's it's the political people doing it. It's the Ted Cruz. But at the end of the day, we can vote them out. We don't. And so if we don't, then we're as guilty as they are. Like, we're going to yell and scream about Ted Cruz. His people are still going to vote him in. But we're just as bad. Like, we all live in Florida. All the people that we've got elected are trying to get rid of the, the few things we have, and we want to be called a constitutional carry state also where gun owners don't even have to be licensed. We, the people of Florida, are electing them. Like, we all don't care right now. We don't care enough. We all yell and scream and say we care but we don't care. And the other part of this is, I think from the left, we have to be honest. A lot of just instituting stricter gun laws, which I think is part of the solution, but a lot of that is just so we can feel good that we're doing something. Because a lot of these mass shootings, the guns have been obtained legally. These laws wouldn't do anything for them. So there's other parts of this that we've got to come to grips with. This is a major problem that one or two laws are not going to solve. And I don't think right now we have the political will as a people in what we demand of our politicians and the politicians to do the hard work. Like the Democrats right now want HB8, the House bill. You know, it's great. I think it should be passed. It won't be because the Republicans won't do it. But that's going to make them feel good that they're doing something and will have very little effect on what's going on. We need to go a lot further and nobody seems to be doing, and nobody even on our side seems to be willing to do the work to actually try to solve the problem. The Republicans are going to work against anything. They just want the money. They're truly repugnant. Okay. And we just want the appearance that we're doing something and that we care, but no one really wants to do the work and sit down and try to figure out, God, what do we do? Because this is a crisis and our kids aren't safe. I mean, it, it, it's where we are now is disgusting. Stan, the rinse repeat nature of this drives me crazy where we all get outraged as someone is sitting around plotting which school to shoot up next or which shopping mall to shoot up next or which movie theater to shoot up next. Um, and so it bothers me having been through it in Parkland. And I agree with you when you have one side that does not care. They are simply so dependent on the money from the NRA. They do not care about the macro, about the larger issue here. And the people of Parkland, I can tell you, uh, lawyers, parents, where they really got involved, that I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, was getting the red flag law passed in the state of Florida to help prevent further shootings. And it has prevented other shootings where if someone posts something on social media, they red flag that person, the authorities can then go to the house. I think what South Florida realized through Parkland is, hey, let's fix what we can fix because we can't fix the entire issue when you have an entire party that is taking those people's money. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts on what Parkland did and the red, uh, the red flag law in general. Well, those are the people, the people at Parkland, people at Sandy Hook years ago, uh, whose communities were di directly impacted, they actually try to do something to find solutions. And again, it's going to take more than one thing, but at least they try. What most of us do and what our politicians do is just turn it into a political thing. 
on my side, we yell at the Republicans and, you know, we villainize them, which they deserve, but uh, that's a sidelight, you know, but we villainize them. And then on the right, they just talk about us trying to use these shootings to take away their constitutional rights. And we're right back to a political argument and not talking about how do we find a solution where our kids can go to school and be safe and we don't have to worry about them coming home at night. You know, that's people aren't dealing with that. The parents in Parkland did, the parents in Sandy Hook did, but on a nationwide political level, we're doing virtually nothing to try to solve this problem. And so I blame our leaders, I blame the Republican Party, but really I blame all of us. I blame us as voters and people who are part of this and, you know, and I, and I do blame both sides of it because I don't see anyone out there on the, on, on the leadership level who's trying to find a solution. They're just trying to justify their political beliefs and trying to gain a foothold of power moving into the next election. Nobody cares about those kids who were killed in Texas. Stan, we very much valued your time during the playoffs and always do. You're a friend, have been for a long time. Appreciate your perspective on basketball matters and other matters. And I think I can say, even though people don't think it's objective, that you've gotten extraordinary at that job as a color commentator. commentator, You might say that you're not, but it seems like uh, you're having a lot of fun and it's been nice to see you working on TNT. You have the game tonight, correct? You've got uh, Dallas and Golden State tonight? We do, yeah. It'll be an interesting one. I mean, this is, you know, obviously Dallas back to the wall. It's all been their three-point shooting. If they make them, they've got a chance. And if they don't, they don't. So uh, it's pretty simple analysis on that one. And I just wanted to thank you for giving us so much time during the playoffs. Thank you, buddy. All right. Have a good show, guys.